I am very happy to be in this wonderful town today and at this top, top university, home of Isaac Newton, Charles Darwin, Russell, to name just a few of the intellectual giants that have walked these halls in the past. I feel lucky to be here and honored to be talking to you today, my friends. Before I start, I would like to thank the Cambridge Union, uh, all the, uh, th those involved, Phoebe, and uh, I don't want to forget anyone, Shibani, Kosh, Calvin, who has given us such a beautiful, informative tour an hour ago. And uh, my friends and scholars, you invited me to talk about Palestine. So this is your fault. I know people often look to Palestine with a sense of eyebrow raising, eye rolling, ah, the troubled old Middle East sort of reaction. For those not directly involved, there must be a real temptation to simply shrug your shoulders at what has come to be seen as an intractable hundred years old conflict. Broken records. Too long. Same story, again and again. But this is simply not true, my friends. There is absolutely nothing intractable about our conflict, which is in fact, is really, really not a conflict at all. A conflict happens between two equal parties. Our situation is way more simple than that. It is a quest by the Palestinian people to have the rights, the same rights as all other peoples in the world, upheld and respected. I think, in fact, this is a very helpful way to think about Palestine. There is no conflict. There is a quest for rights. As the struggle of, of a people to enjoy their full rights after having been denied them for so long. And the rights we are denied, in fact, point us forward towards resolution. Palestinians do not enjoy the right to self-determination. We don't. The right to freedom from oppression. We don't. The right to protection, we don't. The right to return for refugees, including myself and my parents, we don't. And the right to free movement and the ability to pursue a better life, pursue opportunities for ourselves, free from outside interference, we don't. There are basic rights, Israelis, you, the rest of the world enjoy. These are very basic rights. You here in the audience or at home enjoy these rights, whether you are aware of it or not. Some of you, you are not even aware of it. The ability to move, to travel, to pursue your dreams, to marry the one you love, are not up for questions or thinking. But for us, those are rights that are denied. And I'm sure those who follow the situation back home know that there are only two ways in which the Palestinian people can seek fulfillment of our rights, either in a state of our own or in a state that treats all of its citizens equally. These are the two options. At the moment, this is not the case, and it has not been the case for a long time. Palestinians are neither equal citizens, nor do we have sovereignty over any inch of our native land. The primary reason for this is that Israel, the military stronger party, simply has not yet evolved at a point at which it is ready to accept that this conflict between two parentheses will only ever end when the Palestinian people, the indigenous population, enjoys its full and equal rights. Right from the beginning of the Oslo process, it was clear that the 
two-state solution was not really genuinely endorsed by the successive Israeli governments. We were forced by the international community to adopt the two-state solution, thinking that the international community will play the role of the gar guarantor and the enforcer of that vision. But there was absolutely, absolutely, year after year, experience after experience, reluctance in the part of Israel and the international community to actually go ahead and implement it. <coughs> Secondly, the most important aspect that <coughs> led us where we are is the Israeli settlement project in the occupied territory, which never stopped since we at least signed the Oslo Accord. It started long before, started since 1967, but since we signed the Oslo Accords, the uh, 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 size of settlements, the uh, uh, number of settlers have quadrupled, making the West Bank look more like a Swiss cheese than one connected piece of land. Now this latter, I mean the settlement expansion, is the most crucial factor. Political discourse can change. We can change our discourse, our narratives, our words to describe things over time with the political will if we have it, but bricks and mortar actually need to be physically removed. Once I had a friend of mine telling me an interesting term that Palestine is being built out of existence. And it is. Built out of existence by concrete. Uh, <clears throat> and it is. And will be very hard actually to reverse these very clear intentions of not allowing for a Palestinian state. It was a sign that Israel was never going to allow for the emergence, and when I say Israel, I mean the Israeli government, for a kind of a viable Palestinian state, let alone on the 1967 boundaries as stipulated by international legitimacy, international resolutions. After all, what are the settlements but a de facto claim on a piece of land? That's the, the, the crux of it. If I build a house on this strip of land, I am not doing it because I believe this land will go away. Build it because I intend to keep it and I build it as an act of annexation of that land. Clear. So every settlement, let me remind you, my friends, and this is international law, international resolutions, including UN Security Council resolution that the United Kingdom voted for only a couple of years ago in 2016. Very clearly, defines settlements, defines the occupation, the walls, as illegal. And international law considers settlements to be war crimes. The, the, the transfer of population from the occupying power state to the occupied is a war crime. The existence of settlements and their construction were and remain the single biggest obstacle to achieving the kind of a two-state outcome that the entire peace process that we have been engaged in in the last 30 years, now over a quarter of a century, to be precise, uh, 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 has really uh, uh, been an obstacle that we have been unable to actually overcome. And my friends, the whole process was from the beginning meant to involve the international community. The whole thing was international from start to end. And first and foremost, the United States of America your beautiful country. It was, in fact, based on the idea that the international community would act first as a guarantor that the process remained faithful to the resolutions of international community, to the resolutions of the international law. And ultimately, as midwives, the international community will be the midwife for the state of Palestine to emerge and for peace to prevail. However, for that to be successful, it needed political will needed enforcement. We did not just need mediators, we needed a policeman, an international policeman to enforce the law because what is the law if it lacks enforcement? No one will heed it. But this did not happen, my friends. The international community generally, but the US in particular, instead adopted a strange carrot and more carrots and bigger carrot approach. 
To the extent that there were pressure on Israel, it was always wrapped in possible reward. Israel was offered only inducements, more loan guarantees, more military aid, more financial assistance, better trade deals, or indeed all of the above, in order to, sec to secure Israel's compliance. That was the policy. Or if they built more settlement, wreaking havoc there, uh, uh, violating international uh, law there, let's give them more carrots. That may bring them to compliance. By the way, that was the policy. Never, not one single time over all these years, was the stick approach with Israel attempted. And by stick, I mean the consequences. Because if a policeman does not pose as a person who can attach consequences, law will not be implemented on any individual here. Nobody will take law seriously. And Israel didn't. <coughs> Never at once, as I said, Israel was Israel told that if it continued with this illegal settlement construction that is killing the very project of the international community, it would suffer consequences. This never happened. Whether those were about taking away loan guarantees, less military assistance, less financial aid, the revoking of trade deals, or indeed all of the above. In the U.S. Congress a couple of months ago, something interesting happened in that regard. Some senators, Congress people said, uh-oh. <coughs> And actually, they stopped military loan or military aid until Israel uh, abides by the U.S. policy in the arena of the two-state solution, settlements, human rights. But it was soon actually uh, uh, approved. Thus, if continued settlement construction represents the biggest physical obstacle to the process I was describing. And the failure of the international community to hold Israel accountable for this construction, which, let me remind you again, is not only illegal under international law, but a war crime, is the single biggest diplomatic obstacle to making peace. I have been in the West Bank only recently, and to Gaza, and to East Jerusalem. Okay. Only a few years ago, I used to live in, in Ramallah, we had the center of the West Bank, Palestinian cities. This is the occupied West Bank. Now, the center, the civic center, the... Uh, 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 urban center of the West Bank is becoming the settlements. The main infrastructure that connects these settlements, the main roads, are for the settlements, not for the Palestinians. Uh, slowly, slowly, we are becoming encycled. We are, in other words, my friend, let me just conclude this, this point, in the grip of a failed process, unfortunately. It failed in conception and it failed in execution. And my friends, is there any sign of hope with a new Israeli prime minister and the new U.S. administration, Mr. Biden? Many are asking. A very relevant question. We have suffered from the previous two in Tel Aviv and in Washington. Well, we wish the new prime minister, Naftali Bennett of Israel, who rise to power, may have brought sigh of relief in some capitals around the world, where world leaders grew tired of the intransigence and manipulation of Benjamin Netanyahu. But Bennett and Netanyahu are cut from the very same cloth. Yeah. Already Bennett has been quite upfront, public. He said there will be no Palestinian state on his watch. There will be no end to settlement construction on his watch. This is what he said. It's not, we are not and he said it in Washington while meeting Biden, President Biden. And there will be no return to negotiations with the Palestinian side on his watch. He repeated these three no's. You can't make your position clearer than that. Uh, uh, and while Donald Trump's administration was a real low point, it was. President Joe Biden has only ever suggested that he might go back to the situation that obtained before Trump, in other words. At most, he would seek to reignite the same process, those fatal shortcomings I have described just now. So we'll go back to, regrettably, a failed attempt at peace. Moreover, of course, the U.S. is institutionally, institutionally biased towards Israel, which is almost, that is Israel, a domestic issue in America 
rather than a foreign concern. It's a domestic. I was the last serving Palestinian ambassador to the U.S. I saw this very first time. Indeed, it was Trump decision, the Trump's administration decision, to close the PLO office, the Palestinian mission in Washington, that directly caused me to be appointed here, to the United Kingdom. So I have that to thank Mr. Trump for, actually. I enjoy your country. Something good came out of Trump. <laughs> but this administration could make these wild decisions because Israel collects opinions among U.S. politicians in a way no other foreign policy issue can. Or indeed domestic issue even does. On no other topic is there even close to the same level of bipartisanship in Washington. Support. Unconditional. Regardless of the U.S. policy, the U.S. interests, strategic interests, international resolutions, international law. For this reason, the U.S. cannot be considered a fair mediator, my friend. That's the bottom line. It cannot be considered, as far as Israel is concerned and Palestine is concerned, a fair, honest, credible mediator. In any case, should Biden even get so far as to even talk about reviving a peace process, and until now, Washington has not shown any real appetite to properly engage again. There are no appetite. No talk of that. But even if they do, if they do pursuing the same process will result in the same failure that it always has. Otherwise, Einstein will be absolutely unhappy about us if we do the same mistakes and expect different results. For us, the Palestinian people, this is simply not good enough, not anymore. 30 years is long enough. We started in 1991, exactly 30 years ago, the Madrid peace process, which was followed by the Oslo peace process two years later. 30 years is a life of a generation. You see, not only did the Oslo process fail, what it actually amounted to was telling the Palestinian people, us, that for as long as the process was ongoing, we have to accept to live without rights. So as long as there is a process, we have to accept to live without rights. Almost, almost, not almost, exactly saying that the process replaces, substitutes your rights. So it's been about lasting process rather than lasting peace for all these years. Live without your rights. Try imagining that for a minute, my friends. Uh, in this case, this is what it means. A foreign government, a foreign government, over which you have no influence. We have no influence. We do not vote for who is in government or who is in parliament. We have no right to vote. It's a foreign government controls our land, decides whether or not you can travel since it controls the border. It decides what goods and products you can or cannot uh, consume, import or export, since again it, it controls the borders. A foreign government decides where you can live since it oversees the ID card issuance and, <laughs> and that ultimately determines where on your own land you can stay. I was born in Gaza, and I studied in the West Bank, my undergraduate at Birzeit, a very renowned academic institution like yours, Cambridge. And because I was in, from Gaza, I could not live in the West Bank. And all of a sudden, the, the last uh, 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 three years of my bachelor degree, it was four years, I could not live in one address, fearing that actually they would come and arrest you and send you back to Gaza if you're lucky. If you are less lucky, uh, you will end up in jail. Um, <clears throat> so, and the foreign government over whose courts we have no say can even decide if you should be allowed to walk free or can be detained without trial or charge. We have hundreds. Without trial, without charge, without evidence. Just round them. Those are the kinds of rights we are being asked to forego in the hope that a negotiation process might lead to some result at some indeterminate point in the future. Would you? And for how long? And every time we try to speak up, speak out, they say, hang on, you have to go back to negotiations. 
we will say, we've been over negotiating. I mean, this has been 30 years. Why don't we have our rights while negotiating? Why do you link our rights to an outcome? Or is it the intention to actually froze our rights? Or freeze, I should have said. Well, you might at least once, like we did, that one time you might believe the promises of the international community. So we did prom uh, believe in the 90s, the early 90s, the promises of the international community that they will act as an honest mediator, guarantor of international law, and you might actually attempt at accepting such a formula. But once bitten, twice shy, as they say. And we have b been bitten for a long, long time, decades. And when we see that time and time again Israel is allowed to break international law without consequences, we lose faith. Certainly all Palestinian uh, attempts at appealing to international bodies and resolutions, whether at the International Criminal Court, I'm sure some of you who study law or interested in international relations have been following the case, our case at the ICC. Whether we are pursuing the ICC or the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva or anywhere else, we are constantly met with vetoes and warnings. That includes the UK, by the way, the UK government, which has bluntly said that it does not support holding Israel to account at the ICC, and which voted against our proposition at the UN Human, Council, uh, Council, Human Rights Council. And our proposition was, after the last war on Gaza, <coughs> and the attempts at removing people from their homes, eviction in Sheikh Jarrah in Jerusalem, we wanted to establish a UN independent inquiry to investigate what has happened. Superpowers tell us to back down. So, if international actors like the UK and the US, on the other hand, promises that they stand on the side of international law and look to international resolutions for a just outcome for Palestinians and Israelis, but then, that's what they tell us every single morning, every single day, every turn that they abide by international law, international resolutions, the two-state solution. I'm sure you hear these statements all the time. <coughs> and they want to see a just outcome for the Palestinian-Israeli situation. But then, the same actors prevent us from reaching out to the very institutions meant to enforce that rule of law. What conclusion should we draw? What conclusion would you draw? One conclusion is clear, my friends. The Oslo process has long been finished by Israel and its reluct reluctance. <coughs> As I described, the mushrooming phenomena of building settlements, land grab, house uh, uh, evictions, house demolitions, and what have you. The wall, the checkpoints, it has ma made mockery of the, even the provisions of Oslo that it has signed. <coughs> And the outsized, role, the outsized role of the U.S. in mediating between us and Israel will not deliver. Almost 30 years is long enough. <coughs> and the pursuit of yet more confidence-building measures in the absence of a clear outcome and in order to placate a right wing in Israel, you know, just to keep them calm, quite honestly, is simply an unstarter. We have tried it many times. If we are going to engage in any kind of negotiations towards a two-state solution, those negotiations must be, my friends, clearly based on the framework of international law and international resolutions. The focus, in other words, must be on how to implement these resolutions and not what to implement. For all these years, the focus is what to implement from the international resolution. So when the world comes and decides that, okay, we will cut and run, we will have two states, two sovereign equal states, and the Palestinians will be given 22% of the land, of our land, 22%. We accept, we go for a process, heinous it is, long it is. And then it becomes not about the, uh, the international uh, uh, clear line, it becomes about how much they can negotiate out of the 22%. So they don't want to meet us somewhere between Tel Aviv and Jericho, they want to meet us somewhere between Jerusalem and Jericho. If you know geography and you know what I mean here. Uh, and also here, my friends, uh, the role of the international community must be narrowed and sharpened uh, uh, to that of collectively ensuring and in, in enforcing compliance with international law. Otherwise, we're going to see the same uh, uh, movie again and again 
uh, as, we, as we did. That way lies possibility and hope, my friends, by abiding by international resolutions because that was a historic compromise already and by having real, meaningful enforcement. We have asked for exactly such a peace conference at the UN with those very parameters. We have. This is our initiative. President Abbas's initiative, the Palestinian leadership and people initiative. But however, so far to no avail. Look, my friends, yes, we invoke international law. We do invoke international law. I was born in a refugee camp to the very south of Gaza. The United Nations took care of me and my generation and my, my people, our people. I was educated by the UN, by UNRWA, fed by them, provided health service by them. Uh, uh, so <clears throat> we do uh, uh, invoke international law because we feel it should grant us some form of and some measure of justice. Yeah, indeed, yes. But we also invoke international law because we are internationalists. We do believe in internationalism. We believe in the global rules-based system. We believe that that rules-based system is essential for world peace and for the possibility of justice. We recognize that that system, flawed though it may be in some areas, our, our international system, our international order, flawed though it may be in some areas, came out of a genuine, genuine, attempt post-World War II to never again allow ourselves to descend into such barbaric mass slaughter of each other. That's the essence of international order. Never again. We subscribe to the view that the absence, that absent, that absent this global rules-based system, we are back to the rule of the jungle. And look around us. Look all over the world and you'll see that if this system crumbles completely, we will go back to the rule of the jungle. And for that, we will all pay a heavy price as our grandfathers did. Right now, just one sovereign state, that is Israel, overseeing separate legal systems for different peoples. Hence, the apartheid reality of the current situation, which has been extensively talked about, described, documented by numerous Palestinian, Israeli, and international human rights organizations. The last was the Human Rights Watch from New York, a, re a very extensive report about Israel crossing the threshold of apartheid. That apartheid reality, my friends, which we live today, and I might remind you here again that apartheid is a crime against humanity, can only resolve itself in one of two ways. How do you resolve apartheid? How do you resolve one group controlling the lives of the other group without the other group ha having any say over their own faith or <coughs> how do you resolve this? Separate but equal sovereign states, that's the first formula, separate but equal states, and this is what we have tried for the last 30 years and failed. Or as equal citizens in one state. Can you give me a third formula? Can we think of a third formula? These are the only two formulas. Thus far, we have accepted the international formula of two states because the world also wants to ensure that Israel remains to be majority Jewish population. And we also wanted to find the shortest cut to our rights. We wanted our new generations to live in peace. We had enough of our own kids being murdered, killed, drowned, imprisoned, our land being taken, our houses being demolished. So we were absolutely keen on a process that would deliver as soon as possible. But we have to look around, pause, and see what is ahead of us. And how do we navigate strategically our way now? <coughs> um, there, there are no other possibilities, at least if one is to take the aspirations, the true aspirations, the genuine aspirations, the righteous aspirations of the Palestinian people, seriously. One thing is for certain, the Palestinian people will not be dislodged from our land, my friends. That experience of 1948 will not be repeated. Never again. Our history is long and proud. Our heritage and traditions are firmly established and we are bound in with our connection to our land. Ours is a a very accomplished nation, my friends. 
I'm sure you have many Palestinians studying here in Cambridge, and I'd love to meet them afterwards. Educated, ambitious people all over. We are 13.5 million now. We have innovators and artists. I just received one of them only last week in my office. Uh, uh, a Palestinian uh, a student girl who just designed the first ever Palestinian satellite and her project is to be the first to launch Palestinian satellite into, into space. She inspired me. She's at Queen's Mary. That was her uh, graduation uh, 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 project. We have intellectuals and scientists. Everywhere you look, there is a poet that is Palestinian or an engineer that inspires the Arab world, inspires the rest of the world. And everywhere, Palestinians have gone in their exile in this world, wherever we have gone in, in the exile, and look around, you'll see how much the Palestinian community have enriched the host countries, have contributed to building these countries, to the well-being and the prosperity of these countries, everywhere. We will not long be denied our rights, therefore, my friend. It's been long enough. But the shape of the struggle ahead of us could look very different to how it has looked for the past several decades. That's my key message. What is coming could look extremely different. <clears throat> Whatever happens, it will be something to look out for, all of us together. And the UK, by omission or commission, can play a critical role in this. So, can you, and here I'll end, my friends, <clears throat> because Palestine is not just the Palestinian people. Palestine is not just about us, about the Palestinian people. Palestine is, ab is about all people. Palestine is about all people. Palestine is about the rules-based global system. Palestine is about equality of, right, of rights. Palestine is about you as well. And don't take my word for it. Think back to May this year and to those global show of solidarity, demonstrations against Israel's attempt to dislodge families from Sheikh Jarrah and East Jerusalem. Uh, and it's deadly offensive on Gaza Strip. You've seen the streets of London, Cambridge, and the other place. Can I mention Oxford, yeah? And the other place. And everywhere in the United Kingdom, especially by you, by the students, the youngsters, the progressives, the ones who study the actual international law and know the reality, and all the tens of thousands of people everywhere who talk to the streets around the globe did so because they believe the world can be and must be a better place. <clears throat> but in order for that to happen, my friends, we must all be held accountable, all of us, to the same rules, to the same laws, and to the same standards. No exception. No exception. We must all, be it British, American, Israeli, Palestinian, whoever you are, we must all be held accountable to the very same standards, laws, Values. Values can never be subdivided. You don't share a pick. You here tonight as future thought leaders of our world, you will have to grapple with these issues, my friends. You must. As we have been doing for my own generation. But it's upon you now to grapple with these issues. Not only our issue, but global issues. And you know, the corona has taught us one lesson. Crazy those who think they can live in isolation. Stupid those who think we can stop thinking beyond our own borders. And you will have to work out what kind of world you want to live in and how best to secure it. I assure you that as Nelson Mandela once said, there is no justice in the world without justice for the Palestinian people. Another statement by another great man, injustice somewhere is injustice everywhere. I, I'm sure you will come to agree with that. And this gives me and this gives us hope to see the new generations of 
the UK, the new generations of the world, the ones at respected, renowned places like Cambridge are really taking the torch to actually make our world a better world. So thank you very much. Thank you.